Thank you. That's working, great. Uh, hello, my name is Arvid. Uh, I'm going to talk about the C++ ABI. Uh, and this is a little bit of a clickbait uh, title. Uh, I'm not actually going to introduce any novel ideas about uh, how to evolve the C++ ABI. Uh, and also, there isn't really a C++ ABI. What's that all about? Um, uh, when this talk originally was scheduled, um, almost two years ago, this was a very hot topic in the C++ community. Uh, and I guess I'm trying to keep it lukewarm or something. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of an introduction to, uh, like, survey, you might say, of uh, what's going on in the C++ community right now. So a little bit about myself. I am primarily involved in two projects. My day job is at Chia, which is a, a brand new sort of sustainable uh, blockchain. Uh, and also libtorrent, which is a BitTorrent implementation, which is my nights and weekends uh, project. Enough about that. So real quick, ABI and API, what's that all about? So you could say that uh, the ABI is sort of like the API, but for the sort of zeros and ones of, of binaries talking to each other uh, versus source code talking to each other. Uh, so things like uh, class layout uh, or inline functions uh, sort of affect uh, the ABI. So you can see it a little bit like, like this. Um, these are two programs written by two separate organizations, and they need to talk to each other. Uh, and in between, they have the ABI to define this interface between them. You could, you could sort of consider it a network protocol uh, in that sense, right? They, um, they need to agree on, on how to speak to each other. Uh, and if, if the ABI changes, then they won't work together anymore. And that's a problem. It's partly a problem because uh, the symptom of this happening is subtle memory corruption, often. In, in the best case, it's a linker error. Uh, so for instance, if uh, uh, A and B have separate and independent release cycles, uh, you might want to be able to build them independently, uh, or if A and B are closed source, you might want to be able to build them independently. So, so this problem uh, actually happens uh, quite a lot in, in the wild. Here are a few examples. You might have, say, uh, applications that accept various kinds of plugins, uh, instruments, image filters, uh, or Python modules. Uh, all of these things are built independently, and then on the target sort of production machine, they need to work together. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, uh, your application uh, very often links against the C++ standard library or some other system library. Uh, and those are definitely built, pre-built. Like, it's very rare that you build your own standard library, uh, but certainly system libraries. So the standard library sort of has a special place that it's sort of the root. You know, this problem exists in a lot of places in the world, but the standard library has like this problem all the time, and everyone is affected by it. Uh, but right, so any library that you, uh, any pre-built library you link against, it's important that the ABI, uh, that you agree on the ABI. For instance, system packages that are installed on Linux. Uh, so let's go through a little bit about the different places where uh, ABI issues might might, might happen, or like where someone needs to decide what ABI to use. So you have the really low level calling conventions, uh, class layout, uh, and alignment of types, byte orders, and things along those lines, like the table layouts. And those are all decided by the operating system or the platform vendor. So it might be like a combination of a uh, operating system and uh, a vendor building it. Uh, you have system calls into the kernel, right? Those are often very primitive, but you still have some calling convention of, uh, you know, where do you pass parameters? Which registers do you use? Uh, and system libraries, uh, so things things like Win32.dll or LD.so, like the system's own shared libraries that you need to link against. Uh, the the ABI for those are also uh, controlled by the system, the, the platform vendor. And then you have the standard library types. So th things like std string, std vector, uh, the ABI of those uh, partly are in influenced right, by the low level 
class layout, but they also have their own uh, actual implementation of uh, their own layout. So uh, that's uh, controlled by the compiler uh, and platform vendor together. So because when you have a platform, you often set those in stone. Uh, and then you have your library, and you are responsible for that. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to uh, one thing to note here is that this, the C++ standard committee is never in the all, uh, owner column here. The standard doesn't specify an ABI. Uh, the ABI is the sort of practical concerns of implementers and everyone using C++ in practice. Um, but this is, the, this is the sort of main topic where the standard and sort of practic the practical application of it meets. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, just to start off with an example to uh, get on the same page. Imagine you have a function that takes a std string as an argument. Uh, the caller and the callee need to agree on what that std string looks like. For instance, does it look like this, where you have a pointer to the string, and then you have a size of the string, and then the capacity of that allocation? Or is it perhaps the other way around, that you first have capacity, and then size, and then the pointer? Or is it perhaps a union of a long string and a short string, so you can have a short string optimization string. And if the caller of the function and the function itself disagree on what kind of std string, what std string looks like, you will have you know, a bad experience. So in C++11, uh, something called inline namespaces was introduced as an attempt to sort of mitigate these kinds of problems. Uh, so inline namespaces, short, is a way to uh, affect the linker name of a symbol without affecting the sort of source code name of it. So you can refer to std string, and under the hood, you actually get a std string with a version number in it. Um, so this this lets a standard library re uh, export multiple versions of, of std string, uh, and it also lets you have a linker error if if your two components disagree on which, which the string it is, because now it's encoded in the linker name, so they will mismatch. Um, here's an example of what that would look like. Have the function v takes the string. When you compile it, uh, you have the, that long name is the mangled name, and that uh, part of the mangled name uh, translates to std colon colon underscore underscore one, which is uh, in libc++, the version number of, uh, of basic string. Here's the problem, though. If you create a class called foo, and you put the std string in it, and then your function takes the foo object, the linker name no longer contains the version of that string. So now the, the caller and the callee might again disagree on what std string, what version of string uh, you're talking about, and you might get uh, sad uh, memory corruption. So this is uh, so this is not really feasible for for the standard library. You can't really have with uh, confidence an upgrade to std string and use an, a new layout of it and just stick it in a new version. Things will still break in in practice. Um, so in terms of the C++ standard and the C++ sort of ecosystem. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the kinds of problems that arise when people want to break ABIs or want to do things that would break ABIs. Uh, and I would say there are three kinds of ABI breaks. Uh, there's the quality of implementation, where uh, someone made an implementation decision at one point to do th something a certain way. And then in the f later, someone dis discovers there's a much better way of doing this. But now we're sort of set already because everyone has built against this way, this layout, this kind of implementation. So changing it would you know, break linking of these programs together. Uh, another one, which maybe is a little bit obvious, uh, is API changes. Uh, but sometimes the API changes that people are talking about are kind of subtle, and it's not obvi entirely obvious that you're talking about API, cha uh, API changes. Uh, but uh, obviously, if you're changing the API, the API will also change. Examples are, uh, I'll, I'll get to some examples later, actually. but. Um, uh, if you're changing the, the semantics of, of types or classes, for instance, uh, you probably need a new, new name for them anyway. Uh, and then the third category, uh, which most people agree on, are problems where 
implementers of standardized uh, types in the standard library have made decisions that uh, sort of prevent advancing the standard itself, because doing so would invalidate their implementation and their platform wouldn't be able to, to implement this new version of the standard without breaking everyone. And you know, understandably, people are hesitant to do that. Um, however, between when people are talking about ABIs, sometimes these three categories are kind of conflated. And the third category is exaggerated by in pulling in uh, other kinds of, of ABI problems. Uh, because number three is really a problem for the standard library or the standard itself. Uh, so let's talk about some examples of QOI, or quality of, of implementation. Um, again, this is not really something uh, the, st the standard committee has anything uh, or much to say about, um, as long as it leaves implementation freedom to do things efficiently. Um, so pe but people are st stuck, right? In platforms and vendors are stuck in uh, old decisions. Uh, so things like the small string optimization. There are many different implementations of small strings uh, optimizations. And some are more efficient than other, others. And it's hard to take an implementation and, and change it, because then all of a sudden everyone will break, right? Uh, and the done order map is another example that uh, people have been talking about. For instance, Google has an Absale uh, node hash map, which actually has the same API, but is a lot more efficient, supposedly. I haven't tested it myself, but that's what they say. Uh, implementation of the hash, uh, uh, shared pointer, uh, and in the calling convention of unique pointer. That's an especially interesting uh, example where unique pointer being uh, a non-trivial type, when you pass it, you would think that it's just passed in a register as a plain pointer because it's just a plain pointer, but uh, it's actually passed through memory because it needs to be destructed by the, by the caller. So it's kind of an unfortunate uh, consequence of, of the way APIs are, are defined right now, where using a unique pointer that actually incurs overhead over a plain pointer. I'm optimistic that we'll be able to solve it in the future, but maybe it's going to be a while. Uh, the next category are uh, API changes, or maybe subtle API changes. For instance, uh, if you would like to have a small object optimization for std vector, which probably would be a good idea in very many cases, uh, the, the API of std vector doesn't allow this for perhaps subtle reasons. Uh, for instance, the pointer and iterator stability guarantees would change because if you have a small, ve small vector optimized uh, where the elements actually live inside a, the vector object and you move it somewhere else, the objects would move as well, whereas today the object would stay on the heap in the same place, so the pointers are stable. Uh, there are also exception guarantees changes, right? If you actually, if, uh, what if the move, the move constructors show? Right? Uh, another example, this is back to unordered set and unordered map. Uh, there are other implementations of unordered sets where you use open addressing, uh, which also have uh, similar issues with pointer and iterator stability, where uh, they have objects have to be moved around, uh, and also the map instead set. Sometimes, you know, you might want those to be actual B trees to be more efficient, but that doesn't support the current API specification. Uh, so now to the actual problems. Uh, I call them ex all of these are actual problems, right? But this is the from a C++ standard point of view, these are the sort of difficult problems. Uh, th these are examples where someone wants to make a change to the standard that appear to be API compatible, but uh, for s often subtle reasons, cannot be implemented by one vendor. Uh, there's actually a paper called uh, P1656 uh, that has a, some, like a bit of a survey uh, of examples of this. Uh, it's short. If you're interested, I would uh, recommend reading it. Uh, yeah, one, one other thing, the asterisk there. Um, there are cases where compilers or compiler vendors can uh, do dirty tricks or like compiler magic to, to preserve ABI compatibility, even in cases where they otherwise wouldn't. Like they can 
they can do tricks that you couldn't with your classes because they can treat them separately. Uh, like for instance, a compiler could change the calling convention for unique pointer by just knowing that we know what the unique pointer is. We can just pass this as a plain pointer. Yes. <coughs> is it the case for something like trivial API attribute tries to solve? Uh, I'm not 100% uh, uh, familiar with the, uh, trivial API, but yes, the trivial API is something very similar to. Like I think you might be able to do it. Uh, with Trivial API. Th there are proposals to sort of standardize that practice uh, in, in ways where you could make your own classes um, behave like that, where you guarantee that uh, the, you know, they don't need to be destructed, basically. You can... Um, right. So one, one sad example in my mind uh, is uh, it would be nice if std map and std set could be no except move constructible. Um, the way Visual Studio implements map and set today, they cannot be no except move constructible because every time you construct a new instance of std map or std set, they actually need to heap allocate a Sentinel uh, node for, for, for their map or set. Uh, even if you move from one that already exists, the one you move out of still need to be in a valid state, so it still needs that empty uh, node to indicate that it's empty. Uh, this is a, an example where a sculpt lock, a sculpt lock is a, you know, you take a mutex and, and it locks that mutex and then at the end of the scope it releases the mutex. Uh, that, uh, there was a paper to extend that uh, so that you could take any number of locks or any number of mutexes by making it a variadic template. Uh, but at least one vendor uh, had a name mangling scheme where a variadic template of one was mangled differently than, than a regular template of one. So that failed, that had to change. So the name, there's a new name for lock guard uh, instead of scope lock. Uh, that's one example of you know, the consequences of having this implemented and working. Uh, practically. Another really interesting example, I think, is int max t. Uh, it had never occurred to me until recently that int max t is the widest integer available on your platform, um, which means that it will be encoded in the ABI. And if anyone ever refers to int max t, and then int max t changes what it means, things will break. So we're kind of stuck now. Int max t can only mean whatever it means right now. If we ever get int 128t, then int max t will still have to mean whatever it means today to not break. So, um, although there is a light at the end of this tunnel or something like that, uh, every time a platform goes through a major transition to a new architecture, for instance, uh, you have an opportunity to also revisit all of these ABI choices to change the calling convention of unique pointer, for instance, or um, change, you know, other things. Int max t, for instance. Uh, so when iPhone went from ARMv7 to, Ar to ARM64, for instance, that's an example where everyone had to recompile everything anyway. So you could Apple, in fact, I believe they did uh, update some of the libc++ uh, sort of decision, the ABI decisions. Uh, another example is Win32 to Win64. Uh, I think the, probably the most well-known ABI decision or change they made was the exception handling. They went, they went from um, sort of the, what do you even call that? The sort of try catch where you actually uh, keep track of uh, catch handlers uh, to the more common table based exception handling in Win64. Uh, and also, the Mac recently made this tr transition from uh, x86 64 to AMD64. I don't know if they made any updates, but I imagine they did. Um, so, what can be done about this? Um, one thing is all of these good ideas that people want to have could be implemented in libc++ or in other standard libraries, but disabled by macros. In fact, libc++ has this. They have, at least on some other types, they have alternative, alternative implementations, uh, but you can pick which one to use. 
Uh, so whenever the next big architecture upgrade is coming, you can then just, you know, all this is, is already implemented. You can just pick, like switch to it and, and use that. Um, Herb Sutter uh, proposed a, a, a language feature where you could sort of have a portable ABI where you say, you know, we have the whatever ABI or whatever implementation of the standard library we want to use for maximum performance, we have that, but then you can also mark up something to say, oh, this is meant for interoperability. So now, like, pick the the, uh, the portable version of this so that we can talk to each other, and then the other side can convert back to whatever it wants. Right? Uh, there's a paper for that, uh, N4028. Um, another uh, idea that has been floated is to have the loader and linker produce glue code to uh, convert types uh, in and out, sort of. Uh, a little bit like uh, Windows on Windows 64 did when Microsoft transitioned to uh, to Win64, uh, they have glue code so that Win32 application can still call system make system calls, uh, and they get translated into 64-bit system calls. That's really limited. Even even the Windows on Windows 64 had li its limitations, and uh, if you're going to try to apply that to an arbitrary C++ API, I think that's virtually impossible. Uh, there's another recent uh, paper um, that, if I understand it correctly, is proposing that you can uh, mark up classes, uh, for for instance, in the standard library, to have uh, them have virtual interface wrappers be generated for them automatically, so that you can sort of it, it's kind of similar to the portable ABI, except that uh, you can pick the internal implementation without a virtual interface, but then when, you're, uh, when you want interoperability, interoperabil you pick the one with the virtual interface at the cost of performance. That's uh, P2123 uh, from last year. Um, and I want to mention a few fun examples of the real world, what people have been doing in practice to uh, maintain a stable ABI. Uh, so one thing, obviously, if you build everything from source, uh, this doesn't really concern you very much. Uh, but uh, especially if you also build a standard library. If you don't build a standard library from source, then you're still sort of locked into to what it's using. So but if you have a monorepo, for instance, where all of your dependencies, including the standard library, maybe even the compiler, is part of your dependency tree, and you can build up that. Uh, that's, uh, if you can do that, that's a pretty nice uh, way of, sort of sweeping this problem under the carpet and pretending it doesn't exist. Uh, but it's quite often that's not practical. Uh, I mentioned earlier plugins and Python modules uh, or programs accepting plugins from third parties uh, or really any time you have closed source dependencies that you need to link against. So in Win32, for instance, this is an example of, of how uh, one part of Win32 uh, protects itself for, uh, from future updates. Uh, you have this structure, and the first field is the size. And you're supposed to initialize that field with the size of your struct. So you pass that in. The first thing the function can, uh, does is it looks, what's the value? What's the size of this struct? And then it can know which struct you used, right? Because maybe it can recognize a few uh, newer versions or older versions as well. Uh, another example is com. Uh, I don't know if that's if anyone has heard about that. It's still around, uh, where basically you turn uh, all interfaces completely uh, dynamic. So you query an interface, and then you, uh, you know, that can fail. And uh, it basically means that every object can implement any number of interfaces. Basically, you can have so it's similar to having uh, V tables or having a sort of virtual uh, function uh, interface. Uh, perhaps the most common uh, is to use opaque types or pimple pointer to implementation, where you simply make the layout an internal, like an impl implementation detail. The user of the library or the, the API only gets like a pointer to something. It doesn't get to see anything else. And then you just operate on that pointer. Uh, as long as all of the functions operating on the pointer are also sort of on the other side of this, this boundary, it knows what kind of pointer it's talking about. So an example is 
f open, f read, f close, and that family of functions. Uh, n never do you actually look at that file pointer and like try to dereference it and look what's inside there. It's opaque. And this is probably my favorite. Uh, if anyone was around in the BOS times, they actually used the C++ uh, API for their system libraries. So they, th they thought about this. Uh, they uh, considered that they might want to add new virtual functions in the future to their class. So they just created a bunch of dummy vtable entries. And they also thought they might want, need to add new fields. So they added you know, some padding at the end so that they can grow their data fields into. Uh, it turned out that their main downfall was that it was all based on the GCC 295 ABI, which was you know, terrible. And you couldn't use a newer compiler after that. Um, all right, lastly, I want to mention some tooling. There are some pretty awesome tools uh, uh, analyzing ABI. Uh, there's the ABI compliance checker, which is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great for using in a, in a CI. Uh, make a, a dump of your first version of something and then make sure that every CI build uh, is compatible with that, basically. So you can make binary releases uh, and all of your users will, will uh, you know, keep working. Uh, there's also the ABI labor laboratory, uh, which uh, scans a lot of open source libraries and gives you nice reports. It looks something like this. Th this I think this is libc++ probably. So you see all the versions and then it gives you warnings and it, you can sort of drill down and see what uh, symbols changed and uh, determine whether or not it's severe enough. So that's great. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Do you know if there's a suggestion to just encode a type by all of its members recursively? Manually, like, so you actually get the exact, it would yeah. be a yeah. big, yeah, actually, I was considering including that as well. There has been a, n not a formal proposal, but some discussions on mailing lists about uh, possibly just hashing all of the types and make that sort of the name of the, the, man the mangled name or the linker name for that s uh, class. Uh, the problem is a lot of people rely on forward declarations, and all of a sudden that wouldn't work anymore. Because you can't. Our functions will be, will be because yeah. you don't know the class. You might get class encoded in the function. Right. So a function takes like three such classes. It will be. Right. I mean, you can come up with tricks of like maybe you, you hash, 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 hash that string, right? Yeah. You, yeah. you have to allow yeah. the students to actually yeah. translate the symbols. Otherwise, right. debugging would be. Yeah. I mean, symbols are hashed already. Like when you actually load the shared library. I'm, Pretty sure that you don't scan the list. Right? It's a, it's a hash lookup to to find the symbols. Also, but, uh, yes. With Python modules actually you mentioned. What is the problem there, or is a new Python enhancement pro proposal regarding the new file generation and naming using many Linux, for instance? Would that solve the issue? It's like dealing with the with a very old compiler and a very old operating system. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. Um, right. I'm. I'm uh, yeah, I'm not an expert on Python, but right. My understanding is that there's also this initiative to have an ABI three, uh, sort of a stable Python ABI between across all the A Python three versions, uh, and, and these are to, right, to mitigate this, these problems. Uh, but even in the many Linux example, uh, you're kind of locking locking it down, right? To you just you say all of the Linux distros, you better use this one ABI, you better use this uh, you know, configuration of libstud C++ yeah, and, and so it's on. Also based because we still have problems with muscle -based right. Muscle right, so I don't think it solves the, ov the overarching problem, but it's, uh, it's addressing it, right? It's okay. making things simpler for Python. Yeah. The problem is not the Python, the problem is with plugin as well, because as soon as you load plugin, you load all the dependencies into the same pr process, and the symbols are global. 
So if you build that one plugin with GCC4, which had like old C, ABI4, standard 3, and then you build another plugin with another ABI, and we just use it internally. Uh, like the, because before we had call strings, now we have don't, no, no call strings. When you load them into the same process, you basically get a lot of ABI problems because different versions of libraries can come from different plugins into the same process and just fight. Mm -hmm. and then all these dependencies should also be uh, built using the same min mini Linux distribution, I guess, according to my understanding. Yeah, or just use C or just fight on the dependence. <laughs> 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 Uh, yes. Uh, if you develop some open source library or something and it becomes popular, but do you have any tips for how do you document your ABI strategy for that library? Like, what do you do for example? Um, yeah, good question. I don't have a great answer, unfortunately. I think uh, my, the convention that I've uh, embraced is to just have, like, whenever certain version numbers tick up, that's when I break ABI. And, and I think it's really difficult to never break ABI, basically, because if you have, a pro if you have something that has last for, lasted for 10 years, like, and you're stuck with your 10-year-old like, mistakes, like, that's terrible. You don't, like, yeah. So if your library is open source, and you will say always build this from source, then you will still. Well, but sometimes people take your library, they make, a, they make a package out of it, and they distribute it on a Linux package manager, and then some, uh, someone else links against it. And then you, know, you have to be careful, if you ever want that package to be updated, that other binary is already linked against. You, you need to preserve okay. ABI. They have yeah. <laughs> encoded, encoded names and yeah. yeah. <coughs> But it's usually the same problem. You have different libraries coming into the single process, and they have different dependencies. Like if you have library version, eBay version 1, and then another eBay version 2, when they come, they cannot talk to each yeah. other. Yeah. They probably usually plug in talk using CADI, which is like a simple call and the data oriented interface. Basically, it's your short Right. In API. Yeah. Uh, is there any initiative to try to expand on the metadata you provide? I mean, kind of the basic problem is that the ABI doesn't come with can't with presupposed assumptions. Right. You just link yeah. it and hope that it works. Yeah. I mean, in in practice, the the symbol mangling does some of that, yeah, right? Yeah. And you could imagine encoding more information in it, yeah. uh, but the language. As I mentioned, with uh, with the uh, forward declarations of a type, yeah. you still need to be able to you know, call a function that takes a pointer to foo without knowing what foo is, and that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the future when we don't have headers and no forward declarations, you know, maybe we can move past that. Yeah. But I suppose you also have to do something about a smarter linker, mm -hmm. dynamic linker, that could do fancy stuff that would make it. Possibly, I think. Yeah. I think generating glue code to tra like translate code is going to be really, uh, probably virtually impossible. Like my example that I'm thinking of is: imagine you pass a re an, like a non-const reference of a two-stood string to a function. Uh, it spawns a thread and it m updates this stood string, and then you synchronize through some other channel. You might expect your string to update. If there was some translation there, like when is that tr translation back happening? Stop. Yeah. Could, a follow up Could you, is there a value in detecting that your API is working? Yeah, definitely. That yeah, definitely. I think I think that's the uh, where the goal that I think yeah. uh, is you know at l if we could get, at least get to there, yeah. the things would be much better. Yeah. Yes, Harald. It just wouldn't work to match. That's true that we can put your stuff behind the C interface, make the implementation C plus plus. It just matches C doesn't have an API standard either. Right. It's just too boring that nothing happens there. So this is why it doesn't change. No, no, no. It's got extern C, which defines a very statement mean rule. Yes, yes. I said you, you, you put your stuff behind the C interface, then you can make in the implementation what you want and break stuff as long as the C interface to, to the public doesn't change. But it just says that the C doesn't have a standardized API either. 
Right, the so int max t, for instance, is a problem in C as well, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but um, you, you have to say, if you use the same C library, I, I'm not sure about muscle, but at least with glibc, they guarantee this, that uh, all the binary, it will run still. They use symbol versioning for it. And you can run a binary from 15 years ago and it will still run. Yes. Uh, yes. But std string is complicated. Yeah, because, well, uh, right. that, is, that is C++. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they have two std strings in in libstd C++. Right? They have the the traditional one, the copy and write, and then they have the new small string optimized version. And you pick them with a macro. And if if the two things you're linking together pick different ones, it's not going to work. But but you get linker errors. So there's that. I was specifically referring to the C case. Only, okay. Not to yeah. C++. Yeah. I mean, sim you, you can use a C a sim like basically the simpler the interface is, the less likely you are to have problems with this. You can also have a C++ interface, but pimple, so that you hide all of the implementation details behind the, the boundary. So. If you, have, if you only use pointers, then never value types. Then yeah. Right. Okay. But even if you use pointers, uh, it's a problem. Like, for example, say on the Windows, you might not necessarily use the same C library. So you usually ship it, or you define which C library you use. And then a free or a malloc. Like, you can't malloc in one library and free in the other. Yes. So there are quite some subtleties that you even have to take into account when working with C. So there is no yeah. API there either. You just have to use the same C library, and then you're kind of safe. Right. There is no C on Windows at all, let's say use the C++ part if you want C. It's just very recently that Microsoft says, oh, we have now C. Yeah, exactly. C++ here, until then they said, if you want C, take the C part of the C++ compiler, and here is the C++ compiler, right? Yeah. So what people said, hey, we don't have a, a C on Windows at all. Right? We, we want to true, true. I think this is now a good time to, 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 to change to the Minge. Yes. Uh, and you can continue with the discussions and challenge.